In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Stephen Pemberton, a successful entrepreneur who has built two seven-figure brands alongside his wife and now works as a fractional CMO, helping other businesses achieve similar success. Stephen's journey from corporate life to e-commerce is not only inspiring, but also packed with practical advice for anyone looking to grow their own brand. Stephen shares how he and his wife transitioned from a struggling Amazon business to creating a thriving e-commerce brand, focusing on cosmetics and home goods. He talks about the challenges they faced, including a major setbacks with Amazon that left them in significant debt, and how they pivoted to build a successful Shopify store primarily using Facebook Marketplace. His story is a testament of resilience, resourcefulness, and the importance of focusing on profitability rather than just revenue. During our conversation, Stephen offers practical tips on product selection, the importance of a cohesive product images, and how to make your brand stand out in a crowded market. He also explained his approach to paid advertising and the critical role of storytelling in connecting with customers. So let's get started. Welcome to the Ecom Pulse, your heartbeat to the world of e-commerce. I'm your host, Eitan Kotter. Join us as we meet with industry leaders, marketing experts, and the innovative minds behind the tech that is shaping the e-commerce future. So plug in, gear up, and get ready for a pulse-pounding journey into the heart of e-commerce. Hey, Steven. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Really? Uh, where, are we, where are you right now? So I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm smack dab in the middle of the United States. So if you throw a dart right into the middle of the map of the United States, you'll probably oh. hit where I'm at. Wow. How is it over there? It's, it's actually pretty nice right now. Now, if you would have asked me that question last week, if, it was about 201 degrees plus about 200% humidity. Wow. So it was just crazy. Wow. It was, <laughs> really? It was very hot. Yes. It was, wow. it, it, I'm definitely being dramatic, but it was very hot. So global warming is for real or what do you think? Uh, I mean, it's at least for real in Oklahoma. I mean, I've also <laughs> lived in Texas. So both of those states are just hot ju- for no other reason than to just be hot. Wow. Okay. That's this time of the year, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Great, Steven. So please share the, with the audience, I mean, who you are and why we are talking today. So my name is Steven Pemberton. You already introduced me that way. But I am most well known for having two different brands that have grown to over seven figures year over year. And we've, my wife and I were the ones who did those things together. And that's a very interesting part of the story, just working with your significant other. But we've been responsible for doing over $3 million online just through our own brands. And we also now work with brands doing about half a million to $5 million a year, helping them grow their brands through marketing, through strategic advice, different things of that nature. But that's kind of just like a 30 second snippet of who I am. Yes, it's really amazing. You've been you've built two successful brands and you also work with other brands, try to help them as a as a fractional CMO. Yeah. Tell us about the two brands. Okay. What what is the product? Which niche? Tell us a story from initiation yeah. to growth. So I actually really love sharing the story of the first one. Because the first one, I take credit for it. I put it everywhere. I just mentioned it. But really, I got to give the majority of the credit to my wife. She was the one who did 99.99% of it. And I also was there. But with her, what was really cool, because at that time, I was working in a corporate job. And when I was in this corporate job, I just moved up the chain. So I was making enough money for her to stay home. She That was something she really wanted to do. At least that's what she thought she wanted to do. <laughs> but then after about six months or so, she realized that there's only so much cleaning and only so much Netflix you can watch. She is one of the most driven, ambitious, and hardest working people that I know. She's wickedly smart. So I knew it would just be a matter of time until she got (laughs) back into business. We had been in a a business previously. Didn't go so well. And that's just part of the the journey. Of course, for those listening, if you are in business and it's going and it's maybe it's not going, maybe you've ended up just having to, to shut that thing down. Just understand that usually for people who have any level of success, they have to go through that at least three different times. So for us, that had happened in the past. So my wife, she puts, she does the cardinal sin and puts up a post on social media that she's just not fulfilled with her life. And my mom reaches out to her and she's talking to her and she says, hey, do you want to do this Amazon thing? So our first endeavor into e-commerce was on Amazon. But my wife, she comes to me and she says, Steven, your mom's saying this thing about Amazon. What do you think? And I said, absolutely not. It's like, there is no way we're going to do that. I'm finally making enough money. 
working in this corporate job. I'm moving up the ladder. It's like I'm pretty close to moving up again. It's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Why would we put any time or money into this thing? And I said, you know how business went for us last time. There's no way we're going to get back into business. And luckily for me, my wife decided to go all in. She decided to do it anyways, even without the support of her husband. And what was really fascinating was just to watch over the span of the next six months after she started in the beginning, when you're in an e-commerce business, like you're just excited when somebody looks at your store. You're just like, hey, somebody looked at this thing. But then I watched her get her first couple sales. And of course, those are really exciting. But then there's always that there's always that time in e-com where you get a return or you get a negative feedback. And I just watched her as this person literally crying because she's getting a one-star review or there's like an A to Z claim comes in. And over time, so within that year, so literally a calendar year, that business went from just starting to over a million dollars a year selling majority of uh, quite a few different things. It was pretty much like a general store. Then we really niched into more cosmetics whenever I came home. So right before I came home in 2020, we had actually taken that business. And I always love to share this part. The business did a million dollars revenue. That means we did a million dollars in sales. That does not mean we had a million dollars in our bank account. I wish. I wish that's how that works. But we were doing, I think, about 10% net margins. So it wasn't as if we were really crushing the game. I mean, we had that's $100,000 plus on top of that 100 k we had an, a, an investor that was my mom. And so my mom took a significant portion of that. And then at that time, we really had no business sense. So there was a majority of our money went into basically a savings account to pay for taxes, which was smart. I'm glad that she did that. And then, of course, we so we really didn't make anything. I made more money working my corporate job than we did with a million dollar business, 13,000 transactions, six employees. So I always like to throw that out there. I always want to be very transparent that that was not life changing money. But what was interesting, that was at the end of 2019, going into 2020, before the world shut down, we decided that I, that I was going to be more involved because my strengths is all in supply chain and logistics. That's where I had been for five and a half years. So supply chain and logistics, I was, as I said earlier, moving up the chain. So I knew how to hire. I knew how to train people. I knew how to, how to, how to seam up the back end. So yes, having a great top line is amazing, but it's about that bottom line. What are you actually keeping? I was, and I even told my wife this. It's like, if we even just take, if it was a million dollars again, so there was no growth year over year, but we are at 20% margin instead of 10, we have doubled our profit. We are actually living a decent life. So in 2020, we completely restructured and we are, our revenue went way down in the beginning because we're restructuring this business. And then what we found was we started doing a lot of, a lot more wholesaling. So our margins were better and we were really niched into cosmetics. So we were selling a lot of different cosmetic stuff. That's something my wife loves. So that was easy transition for us. She could, she had an eye for things and it was easier because she had an eye for things since that was stuff that she used. It was easy for her to find deals. She was always on the look, always on the lookout for that. I was always the one making those initial introductions with the, the actual wholesale people actually making the introductions with the brands, talking to the brands, getting wholesale accounts set up. And then that's where that brand ended up. Our Amazon day is pretty much ended pretty soon after I came home. I came home in June of 2020. In August of 2020, we ended up buying about $15,000 worth of product from somebody else who was a wholesaler. They told us, hey, everything is good. We had all the receipts. The brand had supposedly signed off on it. But then when we send it in to Amazon, for anyone listening who you have an Amazon account, you will understand this. They check all that stuff. So we sent that we send it in with all the receipts, just like we had done hundreds of times in the past. And unfortunately, because we we didn't realize this at the time, they did not they had sign off from the brand for them to sell it, not for us to sell it. So yeah. huge difference. And so when we send it in, that fifteen thousand dollars of inventory made us get made us end up being about a hundred thousand dollars in debt because they shut down our account. We had about thirty thousand dollars in sales. So which when they, when Amazon shuts you down, they hold all of that money for wow. some reason instead of instead of them releasing it to you after the return window closes, which would make sense. They just hold it forever. So we're about thirty k in debt just from sales, and then we had you know another sixty seventy k in inventory. So all of that is just shut down. There's nothing we can do, and of course that was just like this most stressful time of my life. Wow. It felt like at that That's time, a major event, major event, yeah. yes. And then that's where the second one came into play. Where about two and a half months later, where we had tried everything, we tried liquidating, we had tried 
Like no one would take this inventory off our hands. We had tried everything. And so what we ended up finding out was we decided to just try something different. So we ended up starting our own Shopify store with the main channel being Facebook. And for us, timing was really key for our success in the beginning with this one because Facebook Marketplace had just released shipping. So we have all this inventory. We have the skills from my wife doing it for the last two years and me being in it for the last few months. So we were able to transition really quickly on the Shopify using Facebook, especially. And within the first month, we went from pretty much like upside down, about to lose everything to making $5,000 in profit, which was amazing. By the end of 2020, so about three months, we were making about $10,000 a month. We were able to, we were able to help underprivileged kids, about 37 of them that year. So 37 in 2020, underprivileged kids have Christmas. Mm -hmm. Within six months, we were doing $100,000 a month and that was in revenue. By the end of 2021, that was a million dollar business with about 24% profit margin. So we were making good Mm -hmm. money on that one. And then we were able to help 100 underprivileged kids have Christmas. And that was some of the biggest things. And then with that brand, what we really focused on once we got through our inventory that we had was we focused pretty solely on home goods. That was something that we figured out way before we saw anyone else really doing it was how do we, because I actually just had a conversation yesterday about this, is it's not necessarily about reinventing the wheel. I think everyone wants to have an original idea. Everyone wants to come up with their own original product and they want it to be theirs. For me, I'd rather take something that's working and then put my own spin on it to make mm-hmm. sales quickly. So that's what we did with home goods. We were selling what everyone else is selling. We were selling pillow covers. We're selling dressers. We're selling rugs. We're selling the one thing that actually sold a ton. I mean, we sold, we moved 300 units in a week of, uh, I think it was like a table runner. I never expected a table runner to do well, but table runner, that became one of our best selling products by far. Sold thousands of them. The, but those simple things, we just made ourselves stand out. We did it differently than everyone else. We had different pictures. We had different copy on our listings. When you came to our store, our store just looked different. And we stood out because we had social media that also talked about it, that talked about this is our new inventory. This is why it's different. And realistically, it was not even our products. We didn't go to AliExpress. We didn't get a whole bunch of samples. We didn't pick which one we liked best. We didn't have to to get $10,000 worth of MOQ we didn't have to meet those things to be mm-hmm. even get started. Like we didn't have the capital. So we had to get resourceful. And in that resourcefulness, it became another million dollar business. And then in 2022, we decided to shift more into helping other brands. And that's where we are today. Wow. Amazing. So I have a few questions. Okay. Absolutely. Let's I, start I talked the... a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So let's talk about this major event, the Amazon event. Okay. And maybe you just, Try to describe that more specifically yeah. and, and in a sense that, you know, we have brands here listeners listening. Maybe they're considering Amazon. Maybe they are doing wholesaling. Give us the, you know, what went wrong and what brands need to, to be aware of, okay, when they go and sell on Amazon. Absolutely. So, model. Yeah. yeah, fantastic question. I, I get asked this quite a bit when it's people who are newer in e-commerce because they hear... You're going to hear stats, especially if you're on social media, from people who they have courses or they do coaching for Amazon. They're going to say Amazon is now overtaking Google as the biggest search engine in the world. That is relatively true. So what that means is you've got hundreds of millions of people on Amazon using that every single day. Yes, you can make a listing. You can put your product on there. And you have the possibility of getting in front of millions, hundreds of millions of people. What's not being told up front is if you are making your own brand. So I'm going to start with private label. If you're going to start with private label and that's where you feel like you want to go into, I just had this happen last, I had a guy last year talk to me about this. He actually asked me to talk to his son because his son had gone through all the courses, Mm -hmm. all the YouTube Academy stuff. (laughs) And he invested his whole life savings, $5,000 into a private label brand that he made and it sold one and it was to his mom. (laughs) And so unfortunately what happened for him was he had consumed all this free content, which I think there is some great free content, but he has consumed free content, bought some courses, gone through all that, and he just thought he knew the game. So he went and he bought something in a very saturated industry, very low ticket product that looked the same as everyone else's. He has no brand recognitions. So he thinks I'm going to put all my money into just getting the product and I'm going to make money. And then unfortunately, usually what happens is then you have the transition where they go, oh, I'm not making money by just putting it on Amazon. Let me go do PPC. 
So I'm going to put the rest of my $200 a week that I can, that was setting aside as savings into doing pay-per-click and that's going to change everything. But unfortunately, even if you start getting sales, that's going to destroy and eat away every single part of your profit margin that you could ever have. So when it comes to private label, can you do it? Yes, absolutely. You, but you're going to have to get good at keywords, having that set up where it's getting, you're going to have to get on the first two pages. The yeah. first two pages of Amazon is where all of those sales go. So if you're on page, especially if you're on page three and after, are you going to get some sales? Yes, maybe. But the further down the list you're, you are on there, similar to Google, the further down the list you are, the less sales you're going to get. Sure. So the other thing is too, if you're someone who's doing wholesale, something if you are wanting to get into wholesale, you have to understand that wholesale sounds great. I'm able to buy a certain amount of product and then I've got a bigger profit margin. I send it in. I have a little bit more control. Yes. And usually if you are not working with a brand initially, like if you start working with them, you reach out, they open up a wholesale account with you. It's going to be maybe 10% margin. Hmm, maybe. Exactly. Or yeah. It's maybe that, maybe less because they, they want to know if you can actually move the product. They're not going to give you 30%. You have to work up to that. So you have to be able to have the wherewithal to be able to withstand two, three, maybe even longer months of you barely making anything until they're willing to say, well, you've moved 100 units. Now we'll go from 10 to 15%. And yeah. then you're going to have to do that again for another three to six months. And then maybe they'll bump you up to 20. But there's a that's something that's not talked about a lot. You're always going to start at this low percentage with wholesale, and then you're going to have to work your way up. It's a pretty big capital investment that you have to make. And then especially if you're new getting into Amazon, you have to be very aware that even if you find great deals, you may not be ungated for it. And ungated simply just means you might not be able to sell it. There's only certain categories that you have unlocked for you right when you start Amazon. So most people, when they first start, they're just like, okay, I'm ungated in toys because toys is for some reason always ungated. And so they're going to start looking for deals in toys, but so is everyone else. I saw a stat not too long ago that there's there's like a thousand different people. It's like a thousand to three thousand new stores every single day on Amazon. So if everyone's getting ungated for the same thing, everyone's looking for the same thing. You have to set yourself apart no matter what you do. But that's a couple of the things when it comes to wholesale. Another thing I'll talk about because it's my experience. This is not going to be everyone's experience, but just from my own experience. Be very careful who you listen to. The reason why we got shut down was because we it, we had been watching this guy for months. He was very successful doing wholesaling. He was actually opening up a physical storefront to sell his wholesale products through. And he had the nice house. He had the nice car. He had the business partner. He had all the money. And what happened is he he started getting these wholesale lots and flipping them to us. So his community. And so we had paid to be a part of this inner circle so we could get the best deals. And just like I talked about earlier, he was getting amazing deals from these brands. Deals where we sit there and we're going and looking at the, the brand itself. And we go, wow, there's nobody else on this listing. They're getting a, a thousand sales a month. We just got a hundred inventory and they only have 20 inventory left. That means that when we send ours in, that once they go out of stock, we're going to take that buy box and we're just going to crush them. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, what happens is if there's only one person and it's the brand on a listing, I promise you, you are going to get an IP complaint. Yeah. And simply what that means is they're going to tell you, hey, get off the brand. Or if they have brand, if they have the brand security set up right, you're just going to get shut down because they are a known brand. So because that was set up in that way, like I was saying, is just be very aware of who you're listening to, who you're buying the product from. If you're doing wholesale, you have to be, you have to make sure that it's coming from the brand that you have explicit permission to sell. Yeah. Yeah. It's clear in terms of the wholesaling model. Do you think wholesale is relevant for a new brand, new company you want to launch in today's market with the margin? You know, question, I think you know? if it just depends on what kind of capital you have, I would say yeah. for the normal, the normal person, I would say no, because yeah. unless the reason why I would say no is it's going to be you're going to have to have some kind of pretty decent size capital investment. Yeah, you can go get something small, like 10 units of something and maybe spend a couple hundred bucks. But then it's a, you're going through the same process as if you did 10 units, as if you did 100 units. Yeah. But the same thing that. You're going to have to have that capital investment. If you're going all in, you quit your job to do this. I would not do wholesale to start. <laughs> I'd figure out something else. Go do retail arbitrage. If you got time, go do retail arbitrage. That's going to make you more money up front. Like the margins are going to be a little bit better if you can figure out the good deals. And then once you get down the road, because retail arbitrage, you can't scale because that is your time. That is you scanning products. That is you seeing what the margins are. Mm -hmm. That's you shipping it in or doing more like fulfilled by merchant instead of uh, fulfilled by Amazon. So 
you can make good money there. That's how I would like make more money. And then I would take that money and start putting it in the wholesale. When you can get these bigger lots, you're getting brands to tell you, hey, you can do this. And the margins make sense. Maybe it's a little bit higher ticket of a product. But those, yeah, I mean, wholesale right from the get-go, probably not. Yeah, exactly. And in retail arbitrage, I mean, it's very short term. There's no way to scale, yes. right? I mean, if you need some money look in, in quickly, then you need to invest enough time and create those cash flow, but it's difficult to scale a business. Yep. But the next thing that I heard, which was very interesting for me, is that you mentioned that you did your own spin on actual products that are make, that are already successful. And I like yep. it a lot, right? Because it's very, really difficult to inno- innovate and bring something new that no one else is doing in, in these days, right? And if, if you find something quickly, you know, a lot of companies will jump directly on this. So I'm familiar with a lot of those spins and I would have to learn more you know, from you. What were the, those spins that you did? What kind of uh, uh, different unique things that you did in terms of your marketing? Uh, to, pr- to promote those products under your own umbrella, let's say. Yeah. So this is something not only that I've seen in my brand, but also in other people's brands that we've been helping mm-hmm. them grow. And this is for brands doing half a million to like, maybe they're just getting started out. That's We've helped brands that way, half a million up to 5 million. And then I, my partner has worked with a brand that's doing 20 million a year. The big thing that helps people stand out is your product pictures. Like, and then having cohesion across your product pictures. So the same thing, the reason why Amazon has it set up, and I'll go back to Amazon for a second. Amazon has it set up where every single product picture that you see, the initial one is always a white background. So mm-hmm. it's very cohesive when you're on their, when you're going through their list, it's very cohesive. So when for us, especially because we're using, we're using Facebook, we're using their f- Facebook ads, we're doing those different things. You have to stand out. Like when it comes to those things, the difference on Amazon is Amazon is very price based. Like they're looking for, you're looking through that first page. You're all the pictures look the same. Yeah. The titles are all just like jam packed with a thousand keywords. So you have no idea what's going on there. So you're just (laughs) looking to see, okay, these people are in the top five. Their price is $2 cheaper than the the next one. I'm going to click on that listing. Facebook is different. Facebook was a, was a media company well before they ever did anything else. Well, before they created ads and let you run ads, so you have to play it in that way. Same thing that we see with these bigger brands is they want to be very sterile where they just want to have their white background. And that's fine if that's your brand. But if you are a brand that you're selling something that's very colorful, make it colorful, make your ads colorful, make your pictures colorful, but make it cohesive. And what I mean by cohesive is that if you're doing, if you're going to make it a white background for, for one listing, then don't make your next one a very colorful mm-hmm. one, then make another one a white one, then make another one a black one, like have cohesion because that's going to bring cohesion to the brand. So for us, what made us stand out was everyone that was doing something similar to us using the same kind of products we were, they were all just using white backgrounds and it was very sterile. So for us, we used user generated content. We just went and found, we went and looked for people who had these products. They've reviewed these products and we went and used their pictures because there's some people who were taking very high quality pictures because they had, they would have it set up on their table. So I'll use a table runner. Mm -hmm. They had it set up on their table with a beautiful spread. So we use that. That was our main picture. So people could visualize, oh, that's what it's going to look like on my table. When you're using a white background, people cannot tell, is that going to even fit? Okay, this has a eight person, this is eight person dining room table and it fits perfectly. So that lets me know that, yes, that is for me or it's not for me. Let me see if they have a smaller size. Let me see if they have a bigger size. And that happened quite a bit. So then that's where you get into some other differentiating things which is customer service, we responded as soon as we got a a request or as soon as we could, Mm -hmm. because within an hour, that was always how we wanted to separate ourselves. A lot of brands, that's something else the way they fall off on is, so now you've got your listing set apart, but people are going to have questions. So people are, someone's going to ask a question to your chat bot and the chat bot's going to say, let me connect you with, let me connect you with somebody. And then you get connected and then they're waiting for four days to hear something back. They've moved on. Like they're looking for something else. You are a commodity. In e-commerce, we're very much commodity based. So the way that we made ourselves not a commodity was not that our product was better or not that everything was better. It's just that we responded very quickly and we are very straightforward. If they had an issue with their their item, their purchase, we made that right as soon as possible. If they wanted to purchase, but they, for some reason, were running into issues, the size wasn't right, the color wasn't right, could we find something else? We worked really closely with these people. And granted, we're doing almost 20,000 transactions a year in this business. We're doing hundreds of orders a day. 
And that was still, that was where we hired first was customer service because we knew those communications were going to be key. Yeah. And then those were the two biggest things. Then the other one, just like being really practical was on the listing pictures was different. The other thing that was different is we made it sound like you're, you're hearing somebody talk to you when you're reading a listing. It's not how Amazon does it where Amazon, you're just trying to cram as many keywords you can into that thing. So it's like red, red striped leather, <laughs> uh, organic, <laughs> vegan, whatever chair cover. It's like, that's a, nobody talks like that. <laughs> but so for us is, and then, so for us is what we did. We made it very, this sounded like a conversation. Hey, this is a chair cover that this is a vegan chair cover that was discovered that for those people who don't want to use real leather, this is for you. It comes in multiple different sizes and colors. And then if you want to look down below, that's where we have a little bit better breakdown of what that looks like. Yeah. So it was just more conversational because when you're looking at, and again, messaging is important across whatever platform you're using. It's different. If you're going to use TikTok, TikTok is the hottest thing since hottest thing right alongside AI. Those are the two kind of big topics in e-com. But when it comes to TikTok, TikTok, you're going to have to be different on, on your video. That is very video based. So when you're selling stuff, you're going to have to explain, hey, this is who I am. People are going to care more about your be the founder story. People are going to care a little bit more about how it looks in whatever area you have that product, whatever that product is. But just thinking in terms of how do you, how are you different? And I used to hear that all the time and it made no sense. So hmm. basically breaking that down for you is if you you were sitting next to your competitor. You both have the same product. You both have the same listing. You both have everything the exact same. Why would they pick you over someone else? Like, what? why would I pick you? And most people initially, but this is a very newcomer move, is most people say, well, I'm just going to lower my price. But when you start battling on price, that's going to kill your margins. You're not going to be able to grow or you're going to be able to, you're going to get to a million, just like we did. Like maybe you get to a million and you feel good, but then you look and you're making hundred thousand dollars plus you're going to be paying 20 grand in taxes and you go, I've made nothing. And so then you can't grow. If something happens, the algorithm changes, the legislation changes, you're out of business. Like yeah. you have to have the margin to withstand. You have to have the margin to actually invest in other marketing channels to be able to invest in people. So to keep your margins high, you don't battle based on price. You battle based on value. Hey, this person, we have the same thing for me. What makes mine different even though we may have the same thing, they're not advertising it as it's organic, as it's vegan. They're not telling you that, hey, this came, this is handmade. This is something that the reason why I connected with us is this helped me heal my eczema. Like whatever it is, connect somebody with the story. Stories sell way over price. Yeah. Interesting. So what I hear you say is that you spend a lot of time on the product pictures, make them cohesive, right? Yes. Of course, the entire product line. Spend the uh, time in the you know, the messaging itself, make it more conversational, right? People are talking yep. between themselves, right? And the way you grew is through Facebook primarily, PPC yep. on Facebook, like paid yep. media. So Facebook was the, the biggest mover by far. Like that mm -hmm. was our biggest sales channel by far. And then of course our Shopify was doing pretty well because we were getting just a lot of organic traffic, but then just paid traffic. And the same thing with paid traffic, like paid traffic is something I've been doing for years. And this is something that I work alongside all of my clients with, either in the capacity of I'm doing it for them mm -hmm. or in the capacity that I am consulting them through it. The, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> if, I yeah. mean, it's pretty much that because interruption marketing, when it comes to Facebook, face, these people are not looking for table runners. Like when they're on Facebook, they're there looking at their kids' pictures. They're there trying to keep up with their friends. So you're interrupting whatever they're doing. So you got to have some kind of really great graphic, really great video. That stops them. Then they're going to go read the copy. So the copy, if it's if it speaks to them, that's when they go click. A lot of people get that wrong. They try to sell with their ad. People aren't buying off the ad. People are just getting interested. Like that's mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is generate interest. So that's what we learned just from doing it for ourselves and then doing it for other people. So great picture and probably provide some kind of a, a statements that probably trigger some interest. Not not just pushing discounts yeah. or back whatever. Uh, yes. Bundles, right. Because a lot, I think for for newer people, the first, especially if you're, let's say that you have a brand and you're looking for an ads agency. First off, there's a thousand different ads agencies, but just listening to them talk about how they would present themselves if they were working with you, if they're saying, yeah, we're just going to run this 20% discount and that's going to drive so many more sales. <laughs> the thing is, is that if that is the way that they're trying to get people to your site, then they're trying to sell with that ad. And maybe, I'm not going to say that they won't be successful, but maybe they'll make some sales. But unfortunately, 
you're not going to have the people who are going to be repeat customers. Like those people are there for the discount. Yeah. So if you're trying to build an actual brand where you ha- are able to see not only what my average order value is, but it's like, what's the LTV? What's the lifetime value of this customer? If I get a 50% discount, I may go buy from you. And if I go buy from you with that 50% discount, I'm getting it for 50 bucks instead of a hundred bucks. If it's not incredible, I'm not coming back for the hundred bucks because sure. why would I? So the same thing goes with ads. The ads is supposed to connect somebody. They, they should read that and say, hey, that's me. And then they should go in and look at your site, which then the site should say, hey, that's me too. And then that's when they buy. It has to be cohesive all the way through. Yeah. So build some kind of an initial relationship and then yes. make an offer, right? People don't want to buy for someone they don't know, right? Or yes. in the case of a brand, probably get some feeling about the brand, some sentiment, some emotional involved and and then provide an offer. Yep. Uh, and, and you mentioned the organic traffic. Is it was like from mostly creating content, blog, or just email marketing thing? Or? So a lot of that organic traffic back then, what, so Facebook doesn't do this anymore. So mm-hmm. let me make that very abundantly clear. Mm-hmm. What Facebook did when we were, when we had it pretty much running through there and with Shopify attached to it was they allowed you to have your shop connected to Marketplace. So for us, we had our business attached to our, our shop which a lot you can still do that part, but you cannot connect it to Marketplace. Mm-hmm. Marketplace is where pretty much all of the organic traffic goes. You have a button specifically for Marketplace on your mobile app, on the desktop. So that's where most people are going. So the other thing that they did in the beginning, which I found to be really smart and then not so smart that they went away from it, was they would put a lot more shipping only options first. So then, of course, if you're a shipping only option, you are going to be seen first. But what we found was that having shop, having it connected to shops was the most important, more than just having it connected to Marketplace yeah. in the sense that if somebody came and saw our stuff, they went and they looked at our page, our page spoke to them. Like we created content. That content made them come back over and over again. We had a lot of repeat customers just because they would know what's coming. They would know what's going. So for us, a big, a big push that we did that a lot of people didn't do, even in the same industry, is we got really good at seasonal stuff. So we basically had an evergreen line of products that we sold all the time. And then we had very we had very limited seasonal runs. So if it was Easter, we had a limited run of products that was Easter. If it was Halloween, we would do limited runs for stuff on Halloween. And we let everyone know, hey, this is coming. If it's Christmas, we let everyone know, hey, this is coming. And, it's, and that way they could get ready. And then also it's like, hey, this is what's happening. Hey, these products are going to be gone. Mm-hmm. At the end, as soon as Christmas is, is done, these are done. And then then you can sit there and if you're trying to just move inventory, you can sit there and start doing discounts towards the end of that. But we never advertise discounts. That was the only thing we would do if we're trying to just liquidate. Yeah. So, Stephen, tell us about uh, your uh, product selection process. I mean, how do you, you know, research for product? How do you know what product to launch? Are you planning a lot in advance, doing research? and Or you just throw it there and get some feedback and just kill it, you know, immediately and move move to the next one? Yeah. So that's, a, again, a great question for me. The Actually, what's really interesting, a great way, if you're someone who's not, either way, if you're on Amazon, you want to go on Amazon, or you want to build your own brand, and you want to use somebody else's products and do it in a way where you can you can eventually private label it, it make it your own, is for us, is you can go use Jungle Scout and go on Amazon and just see what's selling a bunch. And, and what we do is we do it in a, a few different ways. It's more than just sales. A lot of people are going to look at sales and say, well, that's generating 10,000 sales a month. So if I go do this, then I can maybe break into the market, get 100 sales a month. That's this amount of money. That's kind of, for me, that's the wrong way to look at it. So there's, if the top 20 listings are getting 100,000 sales a month, let's just use a giant number. Then you can say, well, the industry is looking for this product. Mm -hmm. Then if you go a little deeper, it's like, okay, I'm I'm on page three and four. Page three and four are still getting about 10,000 sales a month. So you know that there's a lot of interest for this kind of product. Next is we're going to go look at those products in a way that most people don't. We're not just looking for the good reviews. We actually go and we look for the, the we don't look at the one stars as much. We're looking at the two to three star reviews and we're saying, well, what did they really not like? And a lot of times people are very honest with those two to three stars. Hey, we got this product. We expected it to be really good. And actually, the quality was really flimsy. And that's just really unfortunate because we paid this amount. And so then we can see, okay, what is the what is the difference between the five stars? We'll go look at four and five stars. If they say it's great, 
then I want to get the ones that are real, like the ones that are like a paragraph long that somebody sit, nice. sat there and doing that and you're for looking a long for the time. Opportunities right in the gap, right? Yes, okay. I'm looking for the opportunities, and then when I find those on those products, it gives me a, even if I use that same exact product, it lets me know what I should be ready for. So if I use that same exact product, then I know, hey, there is a a proportion of people that are going to say that they don't like it because of the quality, mm -hmm. but ninety percent of people are going to love it. Great. Then over time, I can work with that supplier and say, hey, these are the issues I saw. Will you work on these issues? Then if they work on that, that issues, it tightens up that gap where you have better reviews. But that's how we've always vetted products. And then typically what we'll do is we, and you can do this really easily now, just practically. You can screenshot on desktop. You can do it on your phone too. It's a little easier on desktop. Just screenshot the product, right click on it, search Google image, and then it'll show you all the different ones that are selling it. And then you're just looking for an actual supplier. So you're looking for someone who's selling that product for $10. And then you're looking for the supplier who's selling that for $10 a piece. And then the people, then you're looking at markup too. So I want to know if I'm getting it from the supplier for $8.69 and Amazon, they're selling it for $30. Now there's a decent enough margin for me to say, okay, maybe. But especially if I can get it for $8.69, those margins are like much bigger where they're selling it for $40 and above. The quality is really good. The reviews on it is good. The industry, there's people, a lot of people looking for it then I know that all I have to do is put that on my site and I have to market it. But when people see it, they're going to resonate with it because there's so many people already looking for it. Wow. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Really nice process. Uh, what about your fractional CMO services? Tell us more about those services. Yeah. So the way that I do those now is it's a few different ways. There's a few different things. If it's just me, typically I'll come in and I'm helping, like I'm working with a brand right now that it's me, I'm helping them with their Facebook ad side, tighten up their marketing on that end, and I'm helping them with their conversion rate optimization. But now if, if I bring my partner in, that's way different because with him, when he comes in with me, what's really cool about working with him is he's worked with some massive brands. I haven't worked with as big a brands as he has. Mm -hmm. So for him is when we come in, that's when we're looking at the business in its entirety. When it's usually just me, I'm looking at it in segments. For him, when we come in together, is we're looking at the entire thing, the entire process. How are you getting these people? More than just Facebook ads is, okay, you're doing Facebook ads and that's your only channel. You need to branch out into getting some SEO for your website. You need to generate organic traffic that way. Okay, you have a social media presence, but there's not a link for people to be able to click on it. This is actually something I ran into with a client just the other day. Has a pretty big social media presence. Mm -hmm. Their link was broken. Nobody <laughs> could even get to it. So wow. that is a huge miss. <laughs> And so when I told him that, he was just like mind blown. It's like, but it's the simple things. And unfortunately, with a lot of these founders is they get so involved in their business, like working in the business that they don't work on the business. Mm -hmm. So the difference is that they're too busy pressing the buttons, making sure stuff is getting shipped, doing customer service because they haven't made enough money yet to hire themselves out. So they're still stuck doing everything. And because they're stuck doing everything, there's things like that that get missed. So that we just want to help them scale to a point where they can hire themselves out. They can fo focus working on the business. And then for some of these bigger clients, they have gotten to a point where they've hired themselves out. They have plenty of employees, but now they're bringing on agencies. They have ad spend. They're doing all those things, but they don't have the skills. They don't actually know if they're, if those agencies are doing well, mm -hmm. there's a business that they were doing $5 million a year and they brought us in and we looked over the, we, he just really wanted us to look at his website and to look at his agencies. And we were able to tell him pretty quickly, it's like, hey, we think your SEO agency is pretty good, but for some reason it feels like they're, they haven't done some low hanging things. Your ads agency sucks. <laughs> like I'm just being very straightforward. They're not, <laughs> you're giving them $15,000 a month, which is life-changing money for most people. And they are not doing, they're doing very simple things. It's like those things alone, you got to work on, and I, I laid it out. It's like, here's my recommendations on on giving to them so that way they can implement it. And if they implement it, you'll see results. If they don't implement it, you're not going to see the results. And so it's just for me with the fractional side is I'm bringing all of my knowledge from doing this myself. And I'm bringing the knowledge that I've gained from my partner doing this with big brands, upwards of 20 million a year to the table to tell them, it's like, hey, these are best practices. Because typically, it's the best practices that get missed because people are just so head in to just grow the company. Wow, interesting. So, Stephen, how can people find you? So, best way to find me is everywhere social media can be found, specifically LinkedIn. You just look for Stephen Pemberton. In that picture, I look a little bit more like Aquaman, but at the same time, it's maybe a little bit more like Maui because I was kind of fat <laughs> at that time. 
Yeah. So the, the, on LinkedIn, that you can find me there. Elevatum.digital. We decided to be a little different with the name, but Elevatum.digital is the website for the business. And then there's also StephenPemberton.com. Those are the three best ways to find me. Great. And we will add this information in the show notes. And I really like to thank you so much. Stephen, anything else you want to add? So I will add one last thing for everyone, whether you're somebody just starting out in e-commerce or you're somebody who's a little bit more advanced and you're listening to this is first and foremost, the industry is not dead. Stay here. Hmm. Like don't make a big pivot. I have made that mistake in the past, but I just want you to hear me that there is so much opportunity. There's more people coming online every day looking to buy. The thing that's going to get you the sales and change the life and so you can have the life that you truly want to live is just making yourself different. Having the story. Have people understand the story. If you're advanced, it's the same exact thing as the beginner. That's the big thing I've noticed from brands starting out, brands doing millions, is they haven't found a great way to portray their story. You work on that, you'll be very successful. Amazing. That's a great summary. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Your support means the world to us. If today's episode has been insightful for you, consider sharing it with someone who would also benefit. Even one share can make a big difference. Looking to elevate your e-commerce game? Discover Vimy, a multi-channel e-commerce platform that will transform your business with the power of shoppable video. Visit us at vimy.net to learn more. It's vimy, V-I-M-M-I dot net. Thank you for being part of our journey. Stay tuned for more invaluable insights in our next episode.